A senior Hamas official, Osama Hamdan, says that nobody knows how many of the more than 100 hostages taken by terrorists on October 7th are still alive. The senior official telling CNN, quote, I don't have any idea about that. No one has an idea about this. Hamden also blamed Israel for the mental state of the four hostages that were rescued during a special operation last weekend, despite the fact that it was terrorists who kidnapped them and held them hostage for eight months. I do also want to talk a little bit more about the situation that is going on to the north. Take a look at your screen here because attacks from Hezbollah are continuing to intensify. Home set on fire today after being hit by a barrage of rockets. This photo coming in from the Israel war room. Do want to bring in a guest to break down all the latest developments there out of the Middle East. Let's bring in Nimrod Gorin, the senior fellow for Israeli affairs at the Middle East Institute. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. A lot to discuss. Good morning. All right, so first off, I do want to talk about the comments that were made by that Hamas official saying that no one knows where all of the hostages are and how many of them are alive. So my question for you, what do you make of those comments? I think after eight months of war since the October 7 Hamas terror attack, it is safe to assume that there is information out there about the situation of most of the hostages. We are talking about 120 people still held by Hamas. Uh, Israeli assumption, as are reflected by media reports, are that about half of those are still alive. There is danger that many more will not be if they are not released anytime soon. Hamas has not been providing almost any information about their situation. There is occasionally a video or two about one of them, but not much more than that. Uh, I hope that the Israeli intelligence, together with the Americans and other Western allies, does have information. We saw last week how such information enabled the rescue, the release of four hostages. So hopefully there is more of that uh, coming. But the lack of clarity, the lack of information about what really is the situation is a problem when the two sides are coming to negotiate through mediators. Because from an Israeli side, the public aspect of it, Israelis do not know what they will get back. So how much are we negotiating for? What will be the price that the Israeli society is willing to pay? That unclarity was a factor within shaping the debate in Israel about a possible ceasefire agreement or a deal to release some of the hostages. Such information, I think, should be shared if it is existing within any of the parties. And one thing that's interesting is we did hear from U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken just a few days ago who said that Hamas does want some changes to the ceasefire deal that is on the table. Uh, however, some of them are, quote, not workable. So I want to get your opinion as an expert here. Is it possible for a deal to actually be really, uh, I guess, to uh, be accepted there by both sides, talking about Hamas and Israel? I think it's a must because the, the fate of the hostages is something that Israelis care a lot about. Uh, the fate of uh, Israeli soldiers fighting in Gaza and uh, what their situation will be. You know, Israelis are caring about all of that. And the way to settle it um, is through an agreement because military operations can here and there make an impact. But overall, we need something that is bigger than that. The Americans have been investing for almost five months now in an attempt to reach at least the first phase of a ceasefire. In the past, it was debated like a six week pause in return for some humanitarian release of hostages, that didn't fly. Like five months, these negotiations with Egyptian and Qatari mediation did not lead to the results. Uh, with time, the demands by Hamas have changed. The feasibility of passing such a deal for the Israeli government has decreased. Now we have a more right-wing government with a centrist party leaving the war cabinet just last week. So there is more opposition within Israel to a deal. So it's becoming more and more difficult leading most a plurality of Israelis now supporting an end of war within the context that President Biden is offering, that is full release of the hostages, diffusion of tension with Lebanon, uh, changing the, the governance of Gaza so it's not Hamas anymore, and bringing prospects for Israel-Saudi normalization that is something that Israel wanted for a long time. So such a package now enjoys the support of the Israeli public. It doesn't enjoy the support of the Israeli leadership. And I think this gap is, uh, is striking because Israelis are looking for a way out of this situation.
And I do want to talk a little bit more about the developing situation that's going on in the north here, because we have Iran's acting foreign minister saying that, you know, while speaking in Iraq on Thursday, warning Israel against escalation with Hezbollah in Lebanon, saying that the, quote, ramifications could backfire. What do you make of that threat? I know it's one of many that Iran has made toward Israel. Yeah, it's a repeating uh, trend of uh, threatening Israel for escalation. I think it refers to what we saw about two months ago when it was the first time that Iran proactively and directly attacked Israel. That attack was formed uh, together with Israel's allies. Uh, but that's something that may relate to another option of another Iranian strike if conditions change or increase Iranian involvement in the warfare that Israel is doing in other fronts. Generally speaking, I think that uh, with or without the Iranian threat, the Israelis are very much aware, very much feeling the implications of the escalation in the north. Again, it's been eight months of uh, fighting with Hezbollah below the threshold of a full-fledged war, but still tens of thousands of Israelis who have evacuated from the houses, daily rockets, you know, wildfires emerging. And this is a situation that does not reflect the type of life that Israelis expect from their government to deliver, and that could not be sustained for the long term. So Hezbollah has lots of military power, a decision to step up uh, escalation with it will have consequences for big cities in Israel, Haifa, maybe Tel Aviv. That's a difficult equation for Israel to handle, but it's one that our leadership will need to find a solution to uh, in the coming months. And my question for you, the U.S., France, they are all trying to do whatever they can, they say, to prevent an all-out war between Israel and Hezbollah. Is that possible, or is that where it does appear that it is heading, an all-out war? The all-out war doesn't serve, I think, the interest neither of Israel nor Hezbollah. Both sides had the opportunities to go for it if they wanted, but reality is sometimes different than the interest, and the escalation is happening by the day. Now, we saw uh, before the war American mediation between Israel and Lebanon being successful for the first time. Biden envoy Amos Hochstein managed to mediate a, a border, a maritime border agreement between Israel and Lebanon that was failed for a decade. Attempts to reach it did not lead to results. So there is a precedent of this administration reaching an agreement between Israel and Lebanon. The Americans tried to leverage it. The envoy was going back and forth, Jerusalem and Beirut, for several times over the last uh, few months. Apparently, there is a package that is already agreed upon with some arrangement that could at least um, diffuse the current tensions, but it is heavily linked to what's happening in Gaza. So unless there is some stop to the fighting in Gaza, at least a temporary one, it's very difficult or maybe impossible to reach that implementation of the package mediated by the Americans between Israel and Hezbollah. And that linkage is something that currently is not enabling to move forward. Now, the French, you mentioned them, are also involved. They have leverage in Lebanon. They care about this conflict. They try to make an impact. Just today, the Israeli Minister of Defense rejected the French proposal for a trilateral American-Israeli-French mechanism to think about the escalation. I think Israel should welcome such initiative and should work with its allies in the West to try and solve this situation, which casts a high price uh, on Israelis as well as on Lebanese. My last question for you here, and this is going back to Gaza to talk a little bit more about that. We know that a report from the United Nations does accuse Israel of, quote, extermination and crimes against humanity in Gaza. So my question for you, do the thoughts of the UN really mean anything to Israel? And does this have any sort of effect on the war itself? Yeah, we can talk about the UN, but basically we're talking about the international criticism that goes beyond that. Uh, traditionally, the Israeli mindset is that the world does not understand Israel's security needs, and therefore the Israelis were willing along the years to pay a price in their global image for the sake of the national security, eventually looking most in what the American wants. So the U.S. administration is the one with leverage within the international community. Uh, the U.N. is not seen favorably by most Israelis. But what's happening during this war is that different international mechanisms like the ICC, like the ICJ, the courts in the Hague, show that the international community has more ability to put pressure on Israel if it wants. It changes a bit, again, the calculation of average Israelis. And it's also being seen within the unofficial levels, on academia, in culture, in sports, in business, more and more sense of isolation, of increasing boycotts that Israelis are facing. So whatever happens within the international community, even if it doesn't impact the policies of our key allies abroad, does impact the ability of Israel to be an integral part of the international community like it wants to, like it needs to.
All right, Nimrod Gorin, Senior Fellow for Israeli Affairs at the Middle East Institute. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us here and help break down some of the latest developments coming in out of the Middle East. Is there anything else that you want to add at all about any of this before I let you go? Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.